This is Tromelin Island, and in the year 1761 it became a graveyard for the living. Nearly a hundred souls ripped from their homeland and found themselves marooned on this desolate shore. Abandoned, forgotten, left to the mercy of an island that offered none. This is their horrifying story. Sometime after nightfall on July 31st, 1761, Jean de la Fargue looked back and forth between two different maps. He was the captain of a French ship known as Lutile, and he was in a hurry, but having two maps of the exact same area of the Indian Ocean that contradicted one another wasn't helping. After leaving from the east coast of Madagascar, Captain Jean was guiding his ship in complete darkness while up against winds of up to 20 knots, and unfortunately, he didn't need a map or the ability to see more than a few feet in front of him to know that his ship was off course. Without an accurate and reliable map on the ship though, he was left to figure it out using bad information. Considering this, the smart move would have been to slow down and wait until the sun came up so he could get his bearings, but time was a luxury Captain Jean could not afford. Along with a crew of more than 140 men, Captain Jean was charged with sailing west from the Isle of France which is now known as Mauritius, to Madagascar to transport a load of beef and rice. The ship was expected back in the Isle of France in a few days, but Captain Jean had another stop to make first that only he and his crew knew about. Payment for the beef and rice would be a nice sum of money, but Captain Jean couldn't pass up the opportunity to make a lot more. His plan was for the ship to sail past the Isle of France to Rodriguez Island. There, he'd drop off a load of unplanned cargo before returning to the Isle of France with the supplies he was sent to bring back. Below deck, 160 men, women and children of Malagasy descent, or natives of Madagascar, were locked in the cargo hold to be sold when Captain Jean landed on Rodriguez Island. He was anxious to make it to the island from the moment the Malagasy were forced on board. By 1761, they fetched a premium since the governor of the Isle of France ordered a ban on that type of activity. So along with this being a lucrative trip, it was also a highly illegal one. And all these factors weighed heavily on Captain Jean's decision making. While he tried to figure out where the ship was, the crew were busy executing his orders to keep the ship moving as planned, because in his mind, waiting for daylight wasn't an option. However, had he been just a little bit more patient and at least waited until first light, he would have noticed the tiny island directly in the ship's path. In fact, it wasn't so much the island that would have caused alarm, it was the reef that surrounded it just below the surface. And Captain Jean found out just how protective of the island it was when the choppy waters of the Indian Ocean caused the ship to collide with the reef. Right away, this was a fatal blow to the ship. The hull was smashed open and water overtook it within minutes. Captain Jean and most of his crew abandoned ship and swam to the safety of the island. But even still, 18 of the men were swept out to the sea in a storm and drowned, horrifying many of the Malagasy and the cargo had no escape from the rushing water, and those who could get out did so through the hole the reef had created. When the ship sank moments after the damage was done, it did so with almost half of the Malagasy still trapped in the cargo hold. As the sun rose, and in the wake of losing their ship, the magnitude of their predicament could finally be seen. More than 120 crewmen and between 60 and 80 Malagasy made it safely onto land after the wreck. Unfortunately, they were stranded on an island that at the time was known as the Isle of Sand. And when the survivors could finally see where they were as morning set in, they all must have felt an immediate sense of dread. The Isle of Sand is about the worst place in the world to be stuck. First discovered by France in the 1720s, it's about 300 miles northwest of Réunion Island and 280 miles east of Madagascar, so it's essentially in the middle of nowhere in the Indian Ocean. The island was once a volcano that eroded over millions of years, maybe even longer, and sea levels didn't leave much of it remaining above the water. On top of that, the island has a land area of about a single square kilometer. Imagine an island the size of an average city block. But that's not all. Its highest point is just 23 feet, 7 meters above sea level, so spotting any ships in the distance was out of the question. That's no problem on an island with trees. But the Isle of Sand was literal in name. In fact, outside of a few blades of grass and a couple of shrubs that weren't even knee high, the island was completely devoid of vegetation. And because there are so few plants, animals aren't exactly plentiful either. There were fish in the water in the nearby reefs, but those same reefs would make fishing difficult. Just about the only easily accessible food are the seabirds that land on the island, and the turtles that come up to shore, which is obviously barren by any standards. The island is also just south of the equator, and is classified as having a mild, tropical climate. But with no trees or shade, temperatures on the island are anything but mild during most of the year. In fact, Julie and August are the only months when the average temperatures just barely dip below 80 Fahrenheit or 27 Celsius. 
Throughout the year, the island was scorching under the relentless sun, with strong winds blowing even on the mildest days. Frequent violent storms and cyclones brought much needed rain, crucial for survival as the island had no fresh water source. After the shipwreck, Captain Jean, stressed from smuggling Malagasy people and being lost at sea, started acting erratically. The loss of his expected profits and the impossibility of hiding his illegal activities overwhelmed him. Facing the possibility of rescue and accountability to the Isle of France's governor, he broke down mentally, his crew had to remove him from command, and First Lieutenant Barthélemy Castellan du Vernay took over, focusing on survival. Initially, the survivors collected whatever they could from the shipwreck, salvaging wood, food, and useful items. But crucially, they failed to prioritize finding fresh water. The crew, who controlled the resources, didn't see the Malagasy as equals and neglected this essential need in the early days of their ordeal. The neglect of water needs led to the tragic death of eight Malagasy from dehydration. Only then did the new captain, Bartholomew, order a well to be dug. Despite working Togther on servable tasks like building an oven and a forger, the social gap between the crew and the Malagasy remained wide. The crew kept most of the food and water for themselves and even set up their camp away from the Malagasy. In an extraordinary move, Barthélemy decided to build a new ship from the wreckage, not just a simple raft. They named this ship the Providence. Almost two months after being stranded, on September 27th, they set sail on the Providence, leaving all the Malagasy behind with just a promise of return. The Providence reached Madagascar after four days, but an illness claimed several crew lives, including Captain Jean. Barthélemy, now in charge, faced the angry Isle of France governor upon return. Despite the governor's fury, Barthélemy tried to persuade him to send a rescue ship for the Malagasy left on the Isle of Sand. Sadly, each time Barthélemy asked the governor for a rescue mission, he was denied. France, caught in the Seven Years' War with Britain, couldn't spare any ships. This meant no rescue for the Malagasy. For months, the 60 Malagasy survivors on the island waited for a ship that would never arrive. They had no choice but to adapt to life on the barren island. With limited resources, the Malagasy built shelters by digging pits and reinforcing them with coral rocks. In a grim twist, they lived in structures akin to the mausoleums used in Madagascar for burying the dead. They struggled with island life, coming from Madagascar's central highlands and unaccustomed to coastal survival skills. Food was scarce, and turtles, a vital source, were traditionally taboo in their culture. However, starvation forced them to set aside these taboos. Luckily, they didn't rely solely on turtles or fish. Evidence suggests they became adept at fishing, but seabirds being more abundant were their main food source. Despite their efforts to secure food, water, and shelter, the Malagasy population on the island began to decrease. It was unclear if this was due to sickness or malnutrition, but people started dying. In a desperate move, 18 Malagasy built a raft from leftover wood and sailed away, seeking help. Tragically, they were never seen again. As months turned into years, hope dwindled. After three years, only 15 of the original 60 Malagasy survived. Meanwhile, Barthélemy, back in Madagascar, persistently lobbied for a rescue mission. He appealed not just to the governor, but to anyone with influence. Finally, in 1772, 11 years after the shipwreck and with the war, War over, his efforts paid off. The Minister of Marine Affairs agreed to a rescue mission, but progress was slow. It took three more years for a ship to actually set sail for the island. A sighting in 1773 and media pressure didn't hasten the rescue. The first rescue ship reached the island's reef in 1775, but turned back. Another year passed before a second attempt. This time, the ship anchored near the reef and crew members rowed a boat towards the island. As a rescue boat approached the island, a storm brewed, demonstrating the reef's danger. The boat capsized, throwing two sailors into the sea. One swam back to the ship, but the other reached the island, only to see his ship leave him behind. This sailor joined the Malagasy and led the construction of a new raft, this time with a sail made from seabird feathers. Sadly, when they set off into the ocean, neither the raft nor its passengers were heard from again. The remaining Malagasy left behind faced the crushing realization that rescue might never come. Over time, they likely accepted their fate on the island, adapting to a new normal. However, on November 29th, 1776, everything changed. The French warship Dauphin, under Captain Jacques-Marie Boudin de Tromelin, arrived. They found only seven women survivors, one cradling an eight-month-old baby born on the island. All were wearing clothes woven from seabird feathers, a testament to their prolonged and harrowing ordeal. Captain Jacques, upon arriving at the island, was astounded by the Malagasy's living conditions. They had built small structures, a food storage 
storage shed from coral stones, and even a lookout tower. Thankfully, their long struggle was about to end. When Captain Jacques took the seven women and a baby aboard the Dauphin, it marked their first departure from the Isle of Sand in 15 years. Upon reaching the Isle of France, the empathetic new governor granted them freedom and offered to return them to Madagascar. Surprisingly, the women declined, possibly fearing another shipwreck or for other reasons. Respecting their choice, the governor gave them citizenship. The governor took the baby, its mother, and grandmother into his care, living with him and becoming part of his family. The fate of the other survivors after settling on the Isle of France remains unknown. In recognition of this rescue, the Isle of Sand was renamed Tromelin Island in honor of Captain Jacques, a name it still holds today. This little island in the Indian Ocean has since become a significant archaeological site. Since 2006, four expeditions have uncovered details of the Malagasy's 15-year survival in nearly impossible conditions. They examined the shipwreck remains and artifacts, revealing how the Malagasy resourcefully used what they had, including the ship's remnants like anchors, cannons, and ammunition. Another focus was on the artifacts and the remains of those who died during the long ordeal. Archaeologists exploring Tromelin Island discovered remarkable evidence of the Malagasy's resilience. They found three buildings, including a probable kitchen with an oven from their initial days on the island. Inside were copper bowls salvaged from the ship, showing signs of wear and ingenious repairs. Lacking materials like loose copper or bolts, the Malagasy resourcefully repurposed copper from the shipwreck, melting and molding it to mend the bowls. They even created makeshift rivets from rolled copper sheets using bones and metal tools for drilling. Among other artifacts were handmade spoons and an iron tripod for cooking over fire. A lead bowl was also found, suggesting the survivors may have faced lead poisoning. The archaeologists also uncovered copper jewelry, rings, necklaces, bracelets, and a copper comb, all handcrafted. These items weren't just tools for survival, they symbolized the small society the Malagasy built in such harsh conditions. Despite the remarkable story of survival, much about the Malagasy's 15 years on the island remains unknown. Interviews were conducted with the survivors, but detailed records of their experiences have not been found. Their story, pieced together from these archaeological findings, is a testament to human endurance and ingenuity in the face of extreme adversity. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. And as always, keep the passion alive. Until the next video, take care and see you soon.